Hi everyone, uh, this is my lecture series on chapter 3, part 1. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about the rise of Hitler. So it kind of mirrors chapter 2, where we talk about the rise of Stalin, then the impact of Stalin's rule. So in chapter 3, is something similar. We have how did Hitler rise to power, and after we will evaluate Hitler's impact on Germany. So we're going to focus on the first part, on how did Hitler come to power. And just like in Stalin, we have two fact, groups of factors. Either there were favorable circumstances that helped Stalin, or was it due to Stalin's own ability? So same thing for the rise of Hitler. We're going to see, is it mainly because Hitler was so capable, or was he lucky, or were his enemies unlucky? Okay, so allow me to begin. All right, so uh, I covered this in class before. Okay. Uh, Currently, in today's history syllabus, we still talk a lot about Hitler and uh, Nazi Germany because many people are still influenced by this group of people many, many years after they, uh, act, they were active. And uh, it's really a cause of concern because many people think they are, uh, they, could, they could think that they're role models and uh, they are not very aware of what were the things that they did in the past. And uh, the reason why we need to cover this is so we also hope that uh, none of you students will turn out to worship Hitler, Stalin, and these sort of dictators in a sense. Okay, you need to learn to pick your role models. All right. So in this chapter, okay, uh, after we talk about the rise of Hitler, we're gonna see. Uh, so after we're gonna see what was how the political and economic uh, situation that. Germany face and how it helped Hitler to rise to power. We're also going to talk about how before there was Nazi Germany, there was this government called the Weimar government, okay, that was ineffective and weak, and how Hitler himself was quite capable and uh, engineered his own rise to power. All right, I'll skip the videos. So you can feel free to watch it in the slides. All right, so before Germany, uh, was taken over by Nazi party. Before even the Weimar Republic came to existence, Germany was ruled by a Kaiser, so basically an emperor, a king, and he was reigning during the, when Germany entered World War One. So as Germany uh, suffered tremendously during the war, the Kaiser grew unpopular and eventually he was overthrown. Okay, and a new republic, a democratic republic where people can actually vote for their leaders, their rulers, was established in 1918. Okay, so it's called the Weimar Republic, or some people call it the Weimar Republic, depending on how you want to pronounce it as English or German. Okay, and under this Weimar government, okay, it's a democracy, it's a republic. So people in Germany have the freedom of speech, uh, things like freedom of religion as well. They can vote in elections. Okay, unlike the Kaiser, where uh, it's a one man rule because it's a king, it's an emperor. Okay, the Citizens now can vote for the people who they want to run the country. And it's not just run by one person. It's not even just run by the president. Together, the president, there's a group of people in parliament, also known as the Reichstag, that help to assist the president to run the whole country and make laws. Okay, this is basically the same situation in most countries today. There's a, usually a number one guy in the country, but there is also a group of people that will assist or sometimes even challenge the, the president, the prime minister in governing a country to make them more accountable. Okay, so many people dislike this government because they think it's a government that was born out of defeat. They were the one that signed the Treaty of Versailles, which was terrible, as you had learned in chapter one. And many of them regarded as criminals because Germany was fighting a war and they were the ones that basically signed the surrender. All right, so they were deemed as criminals. Uh, November criminals by some. Okay. So these are the main factors of this uh, sub chapter. We're going to see what are the reasons Hitler rose to power. Was it due to Hitler's own abilities, his strengths, or were there other lucky factors that helped Hitler? Okay. So in reality, of course, it's a mix of both. Uh, but besides understanding the factors in group one and group two, you will also or some of you want to try to evaluate, is it more of number one? Is it more of number two? Okay, be able to make a judgment. Okay, and there's no right or wrong answer. It's really how you explain it. And some of you will get to try this in your future WA and test. 
right? So first, let me talk about the weakness of the viral government, which is under the favorable circumstance group. Okay, so the viral government, as I mentioned, is a democracy, it's a republic. Okay, it's uh, however, it has very little support, and many people, many different parties were trying to overthrow this government. So the Viral government had one flaw, it was a proportional representation. So people don't vote for candidates, they vote for a party. If a party receives a certain percentage of votes, they receive a certain percentage of seats. So for example, if they receive 15%, they'll get 15 seats. That means they will send 15 of their party members to form the government. Okay, so the problem with this system is most parties will have no problems getting some votes. And when you have, when you're able to get some votes, you are be guaranteed some seats. So you end up with a parliament where any party with some votes will be able to have at least one seat. And your party will look something like this 4 to 1 figure filled with people from many different groups. And when there are many different parties in the parliament, Okay, they usually all have very different points of views. That's why they form different parties in the first place. And when you have such a big group of people that disagree with each other on so many things, it is going to make government very chaotic, very difficult. Okay, if you look at... Okay, excuse me. Okay, if you look at the chart here in 4 to 1, you'll notice that none of the parties, the red one is the most uh, number of seats, but it was, it's not even 50% of the seats. Okay, so, you know, usually to pass laws, you need like 50% or 70% of people to agree before you can pass a law. So you see that in the past, many people in the Weimar government end up having parties that have less than 50% of the seats. So in order to have a chance at, you know, passing their laws and policies, they need to form alliances or form coalition. Okay, so coalition is basically another word for alliances. So maybe the red team have to go and team out in the blue team and say, hey, let's form the part, let's form an alliance and together we will pass the laws together. We will share power together. Okay, however, this complicates many matters because, you know, it doesn't have to be the red team. Maybe black team, blue team, and yellow team can form one big team together. So things are very fluid, very unstable. You'll see at the bottom, there were many different coalition governments during these few short years of the Weimar government. Okay? Unlike, you see, this uh, 99, very, very clearly one party dominates it, it's very stable. So usually when it's multi-party, it's very unstable. Okay, so the coalition government will always disagree and they will always take very long to make decisions. And when your government, when your country is in turmoil, after you sign the TOV, you lose land, your economy suffer, you have to pay your debts. You want to have a capable government which can make decisions fast. So the Germany unfortunately don't have such the benefit because their government was very fractured, okay, very divisive, and decisions cannot be made fast and the country cannot be run properly, effectively. Okay, there were a lot of fighting, and the country, meanwhile, is left to you know, suffer at this degree. Okay, and many of them, you know, they were very outright murdering their political opponents, trying to form new alliances. So people did not have any faith in this Weimar government, this system, all right, to maintain law and order, to provide stability, to try and steer the country back to prosperity. Okay, on the other hand, at this, when you, in contrast to such chaos, okay, the Germans sometimes they're used to autocratic leadership. So autocratic means uh, ruled by one person or very few people. So they have been for many hundreds of years been used to be ruled by uh, one strong man, the king, the kaiser. Okay, and many of them don't have the habit or the culture of being part of a democracy. So naturally, some of them still feel like, hey, you know, this system is so messy, so many, in, so much infighting. How I wish maybe one man or a few men can step out and you know, lead Germany to greatness again. And yes, you guess it, this will help to set the stage for people like Hitler, who were very charming, charismatic, to unite the country behind him. All right. So 
uh, another weakness of the government. So we are still talking about the weakness of the Weimar government. So besides the fact that there is a proportional representation, there's very multiple parties, okay? The government, although it's run by a party, there are certain, there's a way for the government to end up being ruled by one person. So for example, in the law, there's this article, article 48 that say if there's an emergency, okay, the chancellor or the president, okay, uh, not the chancellor, the president can decide, okay, I'll rule like a king for six months. It's an emergency. I'm not going to be stopped by the parliament. I need to make quick and fast decisions. I will activate this article 48 and then it basically become like a dictator. Okay. And this is a problem because later you will see that people like Hitler will say, oh, it's an emergency. I want to take over all the power now. And although it's supposed to be six months, eventually after you get an absolute power, perhaps you can even extend beyond the six months. Okay. If you have so much power, you can basically do anything. Okay. So that's what happened to Hitler later. So it is a weakness that could be exploited by rising stars like Hitler, right? So as I said, the government was very fragmented, uh, broken into many pieces. There was a lack of continuity. Uh, parties, the, the government of the day keep changing and changing depending on the alliances and who probably got murdered in the political uh, power struggle. So many Germans lost confidence in this government and they were more willing to try new solutions like the Nazis. And later on, besides the Nazis, you should know that there's also another extreme party. I think many of you know what this party is now, is the communists, okay? They tried it in the USSR. Uh, you learn in sec two that the communists also were kind of an extreme option for the people in Malaya and Singapore, all right? Okay, so the Weimar Republic therefore lacked a lot of uh, mass support. That means the people don't support it. Mass refer to the masses, the public. Okay, they deem the Weimar government unforgivable. Okay, and they did not like the government. All right. And many soldiers, you know, many people, they find that under the government, life is not well. There are no jobs. Uh, they want a strong government. They thought maybe in the past, under a strong man, Germany, uh, was uh, had a better life, so he's made the government look very weak and unpopular. Okay, the government also always try to uh, fight back any protesters. So you try to protest. Okay, sometimes the Malaysian government instead of listening to you, they will oppose you and try to crack you down. Okay, so this further weakens the support. Okay, and people from both left wing and right wing, uh always try to undermine this government. Okay, for those of you who want to annotate your notes left, okay, you just need to know it means the communist. Okay, it's a term usually the communists go by. Why is it called left and right? Uh, I think you really know by now. For right, we are looking at Nazis. Okay, we are looking at uh, people who are more uh, Nazi-like. And later you will know exactly what is the Nazi party about. All right. So the government was very weak. So the left wing, like I said, the communists wanted to try and set out their own communist country instead of the Weimar government. And they were inspired by Russia, USSR, of course. Okay, so there were multiple rebellions, but they were suppressed. Okay, on the other hand, there were other groups like they're close to the Nazi that wanted to overthrow government. Okay, not to set out communists, but to set out a new kind of government, maybe one that's ruled by a fewer people with a strong government, okay? And many of them were quite extreme. They hated the Treaty of Versailles. They want to get rid of everything the Weimar government did, including the humiliation that the Germans had to suffer. So they want to overthrow the current government, okay? And one such party was, as like I said, the Nazi party who wanted to overthrow this government because they hated it. They know the Germans hated it, therefore they adopted this position to get their support. Okay, they did not respect the government and did not want to accept the POV. Okay, and Adolf Hitler was the leader of the Nazi party. He led one of the rebellions called the Beer Hall Putsch. Putsch, basically, you can call it a, let's just call it a rebellion. Okay, so the story goes that he was in a beer hall, so a place where people buy beer, so like a pub. Okay, and uh, he gathered uh, many of the leaders of a city 
called in Munich. Okay, he led he led the leaders of Munich government to this beer hall, and he sent his uh, private army later we will call it the SA to surround the beer hall and try to arrest the government of Munich, the leaders of Munich, and force them to like give up power to the Nazis. Okay, however, unfortunately, he failed and Hitler was arrested and jailed. Okay, because uh, yeah. Overtaking, overthrowing a country, overthrowing a city is not easier said than that. Really. Okay, so in prison, some background. So now we start to see more about our main character Hitler. In Hitler, okay, uh, in prison he wrote a book called My Camp or My Struggle. Okay, so if you are wondering, do you need to know the German terms? Okay, I think if you want to know the remember the English terms, it's perfect fine. Okay, so he start to come out with thoughts about how Germany should be ruled how the Weimar government should fall, how a new order should take place. And over in his book, he started to come out with a lot of the ideology, like uh, he started to become an uh, anti-Semite. So for anti-Semite, you can write down, it means he's anti-Jew. So Jews uh, were the group of people, the ethnic group, okay, who, be, who uh, believe in Judaism, one of the religions. And uh, he thinks, that this group of people are the source of all problems and we should get rid of them. And this he will carry out to his word uh, after he came to power. However, even though Hitler failed, okay, he said his Nazi party failed in this uh, putsch, okay, he helped to brought him some popularity. He became known as you know the courageous man who dared to you know overthrow the government. Even though he failed, he appeared like a hero to some people. Okay, so. As I said, the Weimar government lacked a lot of support. A lot of the opposition parties seemed to be appealing more to the masses, whether they are the communists or the right-wing parties like the Nazis, and it created favorable circumstances for opponents, okay, like the Nazis, to try and gain power. Okay, so the weakness of the Weimar government who was the main player in Germany. Was they were unpopular, so it allowed other people to seem like the better alternatives. If the Weimar government was popular in the first place don't have such a weakness, the Nazi party, the Communist Party would not have uh, been able to easily rise to power. Okay. So let's look at now the second factor, which is uh, hyperinflation or economic challenges. Okay, so as I, uh, after the TOV, Germany had to pay lots of reparations. It suffered during the war as well. So there was a lot of unemployment. Okay, uh, there was a lot of food shortages. People were doing rationing. Okay, and you have to pay reparations. So basically, Germany is, Germany is broke. Okay, even the richest parts of Germany, for example, like the rural industrial region, where you can imagine there's a lot of uh, uh, productive profit from people, factories, it was kind of given up okay, to France. Okay, because under the theory, they say, okay, this part of the land in the rural, okay, they have to, uh, you know, pay reparations to France, France will start to manage the rural and things like that. Okay, so many of them, of the people working there realize, hey, you know, I'm not even paid, earning wages very much because uh, the, the money basically goes to the France and the allies, okay, to sign the TOV. So people were experiencing a lot of hardship. Okay, so industry and trade was doing quite badly. Okay, this damaged German economy, unemployment rose. And this thing called inflation. Inflation basically means prices of goods. Right. So daily necessities become more and more expensive and so on. Okay. So in Germany, it was not just inflation. Normally in a country, when you say country has inflation, we talk about you know prices going up by 3% every year. Okay, sounds like a lot, but actually it's not much. Unlike Germany, we are talking about hundred thousands of percent. Uh, a day even. So one day your bread will be one dollar, next day it's a hundred dollars. You know? That was how fast the price of living was uh, going up. Okay, you can read this source here. You can see many people felt like, you know, this whole country is basically in a chaos. Okay, the economy was happening very terribly. Inflation destroyed the society. Many people found that, you know, whatever savings that they had saved over the years became virtually worthless overnight okay money was worthless people rather burn banknotes to you know maybe to cook their food and to you know buy firewood or other fuel okay and they blame the government okay 
and therefore they were more willing to also therefore support other extreme parties who promised to change things and make things better. Okay, and the Myanmar government was not good at making things better. When the economy was bad, the only best thing they came up with was to print more money, which unfortunately, obviously, made the money more value, uh, valueless and, you know, keep on to people more suffering. Okay, so hyperinflation brought about poverty, hardship, the poor were hit very hard, even the wealthy were hit very hard because they were the ones that were rich and suddenly all the riches meant nothing to them. If they were holding on to cash, cash were becoming valueless. Uh, they lost all their savings basically. Okay. Okay. However, the Weimar government was not filled with totally uh, incapable people. There were people in the government that were able to try and stabilize the situation. So one such man was a uh, Stresserman, Gustav Stresserman, who was the Chancellor or the Prime Minister. Stresserman. Okay. He wanted to make Germany prosperous again. Okay, and the Republic did begin to recover. Germany did begin to recover in the later years, like 1924 to 1929. But unfortunately, before Germany can make a full complete recovery, and before they can convince the people that Weimar government is actually good, something bad happened worldwide that kind of uh, destroyed this recovery again. Okay. So Stresserman did these few things. I'll let you read. Okay, for example, he managed to get the French to get out of the rural region. You know, managed to pay off some reparations. When the money become worthless, he came out with new money to stabilize the situation. Okay, things like that. Okay, so inflation was getting better. Uh, unemployment was getting a, uh, I said lesser. Trade was growing. Things were looking good. Okay. However, Stresserman died in 1929, and Germany lost a very capable chancellor. Okay, and people soon begin to lose hope in the government again. And this was made worse because just when things were looking better, the whole world suffered greatly by this thing called the Great Depression or the Wall Street Crash. Okay, this Wall Street Crash basically means uh, it was a recession. Okay, so the economy, the economy basically tumbled. Okay, so... Uh, do you need to know the technicalities? Uh, I don't think so. What you need to know is the US economy suddenly plunged, suddenly became very bad. And because the US is such a big part of the global economy, traded with so many uh, countries, lent money to so many countries, when the US economy collapsed, you know, other countries get affected as well. Okay, I'll give you one example. If I'm a US government, I used to lend $1 million to the UK. Now my, my own economy is terrible. I'll ask for the $1 million back from UK. And suddenly UK has $1 million less and it will affect people there and so on. Okay, so uh, the world was already quite connected by then. So when a bad thing like the Wall Street crash happened in the US, ultimately countries, including Germany, were terribly affected. Okay, so how did it affect Germany? Okay, it created what I call the Great Depression because every country's economy basically just went down. Okay, many banks went bankrupt, many people lose their savings, uh, factories were closed, the factories closed, people get unemployed. Okay, and in Germany, uh, like I said, we lent, they borrow a lot of money from the US. Okay, and when the Americans ask for the money back, the German side found themselves, you know, they have nothing left. Okay, they lost a lot of jobs, many factories had to close, and many people were unhappy, and therefore, willing to support extreme parties like the communists and the Nazis. Okay, so you start to see a similar pattern here. Okay, whether it's the weakness of the government or the economy or the Great Depression, or kind of encourage people to help Hitler, help the Nazi party to rise for the same reasons. Okay, so they're more willing to support extremist parties and the Nazis were able to capitalize uh, fill in the blanks. If you don't know what capitalize means, basically it means it make use. The Nazi party were able to make use of people's dislike for the, the government. They were able to make use of the people's worries and promise them uh, better days ahead and therefore get their support. Okay, now let's now talk about how did Hitler do that actually made himself popular. They actually allow him to rise to power. So far, we have been talking about all the other players, the government, the economy, external events like the Great Depression. So what 
exactly make Hitler stand out. Okay, let's investigate. Okay, so we need to know what was Hitler's leadership ability like and how did this help him rise to power? You explain the logic. Okay, so a few brief intro to Hitler. He was born in the 1800s. Okay, uh, he used to be a small boy, just like every uh, bad person. Okay. Now, um, now uh, his family, his uh, father, okay, was obviously also uh, not uh, very stable, okay, uh, distant, aggressive, violent, okay, and oftentimes when you're raised in a uh, unstable family, sometimes it has a lot of impact on how the children grow up, okay. Okay, here we can see uh, the, the mom often suffered from the beating from the husband and it made Hitler very angry and Hitler always wanted to murder his father and even marry his mother. Okay, that is very weird, but you can imagine Hitler was kind of uh, having a very difficult time when he was young and perhaps this might affect how his worldview later on when he's an adult. Okay, as a student, he was not very smart. You can see his results are uh, not very good. Okay. Unsatisfactory for many things. Only excellent in gymnastics and art. So he's excellent in art. Okay. And uh, in World War I, he volunteered to fight for Germany. Okay. He got some medals. However, he was only a corporal. And for those in the UGs, you know, corporal is really just a very uh, low and ordinary rank. So he was nothing. He was not like an officer or general, you know. And he was uh, recovering from hospital when uh, Germany surrendered. Okay, so apparently he was uh, attacked by a master gas and he was blinded. And as a soldier who fought so hard, you can imagine how he felt when he said, you know, I fought so hard, my comrades fought so hard, and now Germany just surrendered like this. How this must have hurt his feelings. All right. And uh, after the war, he tried to be an artist. However, he was rejected. Okay. And uh, he was uh, quite good at, you know, uh, he's probably quite good at art also. Okay, that's why uh, some people say he was very good at making counterfeit artworks, okay, to maybe sell. Okay, so that was Hitler's background. What is it now about Hitler's ability that helped him to rise to power? Okay, let's examine one by one. So first of all, we are talking about Nazi ideology. And ideology basically is a belief. So what does the party, what does Hitler believe? Okay, so Hitler uh, okay, set up a Nazi party. It was not called the Nazi party at first. Okay, it was uh, called, I think, the Workers' Party or some sort like that. But he changed it to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP, who was uh, abbreviated to the Nazi party. Okay, and one, these are some of the ideologies that uh, Hitler believed in. First of all, you can see on the top, he wants Germany to be big and strong. He wants to expand German territory because people need space to live. He wants to have a strong Germany. He wants Germany to rule by a single group of people called the Aryans, which are the Germans, the pure Germans, according to him. He wants Germany to be self-sufficient. He wants Germany to be able to produce its own food and not depend on any other country for survival. All right. And he hated two groups of people. One group were the Jews, and one group were the communists. These two groups he hated uh, a lot. Okay, and the both of them will suffer a lot under Hitler. Both groups of people. Okay, now so the Nazis promised to save Germans from their suffering, from the economic problem, from the weak government of that time. Many people have really lost faith in the existing government. So Hitler was able to use this plan, this idea that Germany would be great again. And he greatly appealed to the Germans who therefore decided, hey, maybe he's on to something, maybe let's give him a chance. Number two, Hitler also writes about because he himself was a very charismatic orator. He speaks very well. Uh, you can YouTube, uh, there are many Hitler speeches posted on YouTube. You might not understand German, but you can see uh, how electrifying his speeches was. Okay, uh, people felt he was sincere. People were able to 
think that he empathized with the people and they were even convinced to think that you know groups like the jews basically all the things that he learned believe he managed to convince ordinary germans to feel the same okay i shall leave out this speech you can go and watch yourself okay he sound passionate he sound like a credible credible means believable okay i can trust Hitler has the solution to help people end their misery. Okay, number three, Hitler was able to rise to power because people, there were people who feared communism. Just now we mentioned that there are some people who wanted to support communism because they were an extreme party. An extreme party promised an extreme solution to end the extreme suffering they were facing. But there were also people who were not comfortable with this communist ideology. So Hitler was able to uh, get support from this group of people who did not like communists, who feared communists, to instead choose to support his party. Okay, so in the 1928, the Communist Party actually had the upper hand. They actually got more votes than the Nazi Party. So the communists were actually quite popular. All right, but many businesses, many wealthy Germans start to be very scared because German, the communists believe that there should be equality. There should be no private property. So many people, afraid of losing their property, turn to support the communists. So now you imagine, these big industry wealthy people, they have the money. Now instead, they decide to support the Nazi party. The Nazi party now has a very strong supporter, have a lot of financial backing for these people. The rich man can now pay the Nazi party to help run their parties, to help them buy supporters. You know, So it helped the Nazi parties tremendously to win over this group of people. Okay, as a result, the Nazis were stronger, richer, and later on able to get support nationwide. All right? Even ordinary people like, uh, like farmers, they also support the Nazi party because many people uh, you have learned under the previous chapter, communist policies were very extreme and did not always work. In Unit, Soviet Union, we learned that the Kulaks, the rich farmers, did not want support Stalin's policy of collectivization because they did not want to lose their land to the state. So even in Germany, farmers, after they heard what happened in the Soviet Union, they might therefore be very afraid of losing their land and therefore support the enemy of the communists, which was the Nazi party, okay, to keep their land. Okay, so Hitler made use of this people's fear of communism start to actively hunt down the communism and even arrest them. So he has a personal army okay, called the uh, SA. Okay. They were able to, you know, sometimes he just sent an army to the communist meeting and just, you know, arrest people and they'll beat them up. So many people feel that, you know, uh, communism is probably worse than Nazi and therefore they are willing to support Nazi party instead. All right. So his strong anti-communist sentiments, okay, and his ability to use military force, okay, helped to convince the Nazis, uh, the rich and the ordinary people that Nazis were able to restore Germany, and Hitler was able to get more support from people's fear of communism. All right. Last but not least, uh, Hitler also rose because he managed to reorganize the Nazi Party. So what did he do? Okay, after Hitler failed in the beer hall push to overthrow the Weimar government. Okay, he tried to make the Nazi party stronger. So for example, he increased party membership. He created his personal army like the SA and the SS. The SA has a very interesting name called the Stormtroopers. Okay, so maybe the creator of Star Wars based it on it. Okay, he also learned to use propaganda a lot more to get his message out. Even he had to fake it a bit in order to get supports he's willing to do it, all right? So after he was released from prison for the failed putsch, the failed rebellion, he tried to increase more, uh, recruit more party members. He created, you know, like the local branches that mean every neighborhood may have a Nazi party member to spread a good word of the Nazi party. He created uh, new clubs, okay, like, like your NCC maybe, to get people to, you know, uh, join and get involved in Nazi party activities and spread the awareness among people. Okay. Okay. So just now I mentioned the SA, the SS. Okay, they were very 
they were considered they were not the army of Germany, but it was like a private army, so like private soldiers. So they worked for the party, they worked for Hitler. And they were strong and disciplined. And it gave them the impression that you know they can create stability in Germany. Remember at that time Germany was very chaotic. People were there were a lot of people fighting in the government, you know. So people start to like this discipline approach that the Nazi Party seemed to be able to uh, carry out. Okay. Propaganda, uh, spreading uh, sometimes even lies to make people believe certain things. So Hitler, not only Hitler was a good speaker, he had many assistants while then being Mr. Joseph Goebbels. He was the propaganda minister and he was able to count in many propaganda, whether it's poster, whether it's movies, uh, very emotionally charged ones to make people feel strongly for the Nazi party. Make people think that the next party is strong and capable and therefore the number one choice for you to be German. Okay, so he managed to restore stability. Okay, he not restore stability, he allowed people to think that he can restore stability. He can run the party well. He can, if he can run the party well, people will believe that he can run Germany, the country well also. Okay, so people are more willing to vote for the Nazis. And therefore, with more votes, the Nazis were able to rise to power. Okay, Hitler was also very skillful at making deals. Okay, for example, uh, although Hitler won the 1932 election, he had the most votes. He was distrusted by the president. Okay, who did not trust Hitler and the Nazi party. Okay, however, Hitler eventually were able to overcome this difficulty and even take over the role of president himself. Okay, so what happened? Okay. All right. At first Hitler, although he won the election, the president thought, okay, there are still many people, other people that are not the Nazi party in the right stack, the parliament, they can help me to control Hitler. Okay, but Hitler, okay, after a few years as chancellor, okay, he was wanted to call for a new election, okay, hoping to get even more votes and more seats. Okay, so he realized that you know the he would have a very uh, slim chance for him to gain power through the elections. Okay, so he employed this strategy and dealing with his uh, other political rivals okay, to slowly rise to power and impose one party rule. Okay, so therefore, this is uh, the factors that help to contribute to Hitler's rise to power. I know it's quite a lot to digest, but there are a lot of overlaps. For example, weak Weimar government, weak economy, population, weak pressure, they are all kind of interlinked. Okay, Hitler's ideology, charisma, his ability to galvanize people's fears. Uh, there, are, there are some similar points. Like, so, uh, the least you can do is try and uh, uh, you can memorize these points, but uh, you might not want to spend so much time memorizing what each of these things mean. Try and understand what they mean. And when, then after that, when you memorize these points, you can use your own words to describe what these factors are and explain how it helped people to come to power. All right. Okay, so uh, let's skip this activity. Uh, maybe we'll do it in class next time. Okay. And in the next lesson, we will see how did Hitler's rule impact Germany, what were the positive impact, what were the negative impact, how like studying what were the political impact, economic impact, and social impact. Alright. Okay, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.